what's up? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024. I'm one of your hosts, Blessing, Addy O.A. Jr., and I'm joined by Sam Barlow, a.k.a. part of Half Mermaid. Sam, how's it going? Going great. Well, welcome to the show. Thanks Thank so much you. for joining me. Uh, Glad to be here in I'm, real life and, and have the man inside my computer. I'm, I'm excited to have the man who, who makes the games that I really like be here to, to actually talk to me and, and chat about them. Because, of course, Sam, you are behind Immortality. You're behind games such as Telling Lies and Her Story. Um, these are all really cool FMV games that a lot of people love. And I think at this point, pretty much everybody who's in the know of video games knows about your games. Like Immortality yeah. made such a big splash when it came out that year and it was at the Game Awards and did all these things. What is it like now being in, I guess, what, 2024? I guess over the, the, yeah. over the course of your last three games to be where you're at right now. How, like, how's, it, how's that been for, for you? It's cool. Like, it, it never stops feeling like you're getting away with something. Um, but to be, like, you know, I, before I did Her Story, uh, you know, I was in, in proper games, working with bigger publishers, and it was always such... A struggle to get cool things passed. In fact, a lot of the time you would kind of lie, right? There was a lot of lying to publishers to sneak cool ideas mm -hmm. up, up to that level. Uh, and so I think the coolest thing is to be in a position where I'm not often having to like, sell things, right? I'm not having to, to give people the hard sell of like, this is like, no, I wasn't pitching people immortality, right? Like, yeah. this is, this is going to be your next big game. It was like, okay, this is a cool, weird thing that I think is really neat. And, uh, you know, so I'm in this position where I can kind of explore those ideas. And that's, that's Hell yeah. What is, for you, because I, again, one of the things you do is you make these FMB games, right? You make these games where it is the player has to put together these stories, figure out what's going on. And it is people having to like search through essentially like databases of clips, databases of, uh, of footage, like each of your games kind of do it in a different way. Um, but yeah, all your games so far, at least the last three games that have like really, that really made, a, uh, made a mark critically have been these FMV style games. And for me, I look at myself as somebody who I really like Choose Your Own Adventure. I really like a lot of FMV stuff as well. I, you know, I, I play your stuff and then also I play Whales Interactive stuff, which is like more so straightforward, choose your own adventure, kind of cheesy, like, you know, um, uh, movie type games. But then, like, you know, there's a whole spectrum between those of different things that you can do with FMV. We see, like, even the latest Alan Wake game did a lot with FMV. Um, and, like, uh, Hellblade as well has done really cool stuff in implementing FMV. What's, what is it for you with that style of video game that really appeals to you? I, th I mean, it, it's something I did accidentally, right? It wasn't, it wasn't a conscious decision I made. Uh, when I made Her Story, I was, I was trying to figure out how can I make a detective game that fixes some of the problems that I see, right? I was obsessed with like Phoenix Wright. I'd, I'd played uh, like L.A. Noir and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to come up with my solution to like, how do I make something that is freer, like more organic? And I was like immersed in the world of detectiving and true crime and murder. And I realized like I'm watching all this video footage of people's interviews. And at some point, like my brain just clicked and was like, hey, why, why can't this be the game, right? And then I got really excited because uh, even with the bigger games I was making, there was always an emphasis on character, right? If you're trying to tell stories, having a character on screen, super important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were doing lots of stuff with performance capture, which was, you know, that is, is like such a, uh, an effort and a struggle, right? To, to capture all the nuances of, of human expression and then put that on a CGI character. Um, and at the time, so this was like, you know, 2010s, like it was hard, right? You were manually having to tweak everything to try and get the, the emotion. So when I kind of hit that with her story and I was like, oh, I can just point the camera mm -hmm. and capture all this. And like a big part of her story was, can we tell a game where there is subtext, right? And where actually the game mechanics are about what's going on behind the scenes, right? What's between the words, what is going on in this actress's face? So really like the live action kind of, was was a huge part of that right you couldn't really have got that across without the live action and sort of then since then it's been a bigger journey of like what does it mean to explore video right it, what if we treat uh the video in this game as you would the the map in zelda mm -hmm. or, or a space station in metroid um how do we have that same relationship of exploring and revisiting and putting things together that you have in those kind of more traditional games. Oh yeah. 
well immortality is out today on ps5 that's why uh, you're here that's why you've come through and you're going to be on the stream after this as well hanging out with greg doing it and also uh with mount engage uh hanging out and doing a bunch of fun stuff um but also on steam today it seems like you've dropped two new or not dropped the projects but i guess announced the projects two new mystery projects which has now made our story number one. So we'll talk about that in a bit, <laughs> but congrats on immortality coming out to PS five. I'm sure that feels great for you having this game out on, on more platforms. Yeah. I mean, day one, when we released immortality, there were a lot of people who were like, Hey, where's the love for Sony? Like PlayStation gamers love their dark cinematic things. Like this should be on this platform. Right. And so mm -hmm. we, you know, taken, taken our time and now it's there and, uh, feels really good with the dual sense. Hell yeah. So yeah, I'm excited to see, uh, yeah, it was it was a delight when Immortality first came out, sort of seeing the process of people playing the game, hitting certain points, discovering certain layers, and creating these little moments, especially like amongst their communities, where everyone was playing Immortality together, and sort of being like pinging off each other. Yeah. Like kind sort of seeing that happen within the PlayStation. Can I tell you how how crazy I felt like I was going when I was <laughs> when I was playing through Immortality for the first time? Because I played it during the review period, and so I didn't have many people to talk mm -hmm. to. And I think I was ahead of Greg as I was playing it. And so it was just a thing of me just sifting through the footage, right? And like you mentioned, how do you do, how do you have people interact with the game in a way that, that yeah, like in, when you're playing Zelda, like you're playing with the map in a certain way. Or when you're playing other games, there's a certain like back and forth feedback that you're getting. I do want to commend you and the team for Immortality's gameplay. Because I, you know, I think the first, at first blush, you look at an FMV, you look at a live action thing and go, oh, okay, I'm like either choosing my own adventure or i'm just watching a movie or, or whatever it is the gameplay of immortality is actually something that i really enjoy just the idea of going through the uh, different clips clicking on an object in the clip or a word in the subtitles or whatever it is and being um transferred to a new thing or transferred to a new clip and trying to figure out how to unearth certain details about the story that way i really really enjoyed that process um but yeah like immortality is a game that people can play uh, today on ps5 i urge y'all to go check it out um we're gonna... go, go buy a copy for yourself, for your loved yeah. ones. It's the perfect wedding gift, birthday gift, just treat to yourself. Yeah. We're going to get into the news. Uh, but before we do, a question that I like to ask guests who show up on the show. What is your favorite game of all time? Oh, this is a good conversation. Ender or starter. Um, my favorite game of all time is A Mind Forever Voyaging by okay. Infocom from 1985, I want to say. Okay, I've no, this is the first time where somebody's answered the question. I have no idea what this game is. This is I did this. I came off. Uh, it was like the South by Southwest Gaming Awards, and I came off, and IGN were waiting for me, and they, it was all like big, you know, explosions, noise, deep bass, and they were like, "Yo, dude, what's your favorite game of all time?" Was and I said, I know "A Mind Forever Voyaging," <laughs> and it was like, like "Cool." Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is this game? Uh, it uh, it's it's like the original. Uh, open world city simulator narrative game. It is a science fiction text adventure uh, by Steve Moretzky. He was the first video game writer to be inducted into the American Science Fiction Writers Association because of this game. And uh, the, the basic premise of the game is you are uh, an AI, very topical uh, in the 1980s, uh, who's placed in a simulation uh, of a small town in America. And the idea is you are supposed to live out a normal life in this simulation to gather data for essentially a Ronald Reagan type figure to prove that his po policies are going to work. And once you've done enough stuff in the world, it unlocks the next simulation that's like 10 years in the future. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that's the map. Uh, and uh, then 15, 20 years in the future. And so it's, 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 it's a text adventure, but it's open world. You're walking around, uh, you get given this checklist to do that's like, here's some stuff that normal people do. Go out for a meal, read a newspaper, see a sports game. Uh, you have like a wife in this world, so you have like a little personality. So you, you know, the amount of freedom at the time that you had and the fact that this is a game where you're doing, all, you know, you're not running around fighting orcs or whatever, you're doing all these things. Um, and the, the way the gameplay works is you as this AI have to record what, you're doing to then send back to the scientists who are outside of the matrix. Mm -hmm. And so the first stage of the game, you're going around, you're recording this, everything seems chill. You jump forward five years in the future, things seem better. So you're like, oh yeah, I guess Reagan's policies work. This is all great. And you get to the point where the scientists are like, cool, you've done your job. Feel free to continue to live your pretend existence. We've, we've proven that this plan works. And so then the player is kind of dropped and you'll see there's a link to my games here. Like, with no real purpose then, just exploring the world. And as you do that, 
you unlock the next 25 years, or the next 30, 40 years. And as you start exploring that, you see that everything starts going to shit. And it becomes this, I mean... Uh, That's fucking awesome. When, uh, when Donald Trump stuff was happening, yeah. I remember people dug up Steve Moretzky because they were like, hey, you made this game that at the time people said was heavy-handed. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the Trump stuff is like... So it's... it's that's awesome. Uh, you know, it's, it's I mean, a that game that I still go back to. What year did you say it came out? Uh, 1985. That's insane. And that's like a really cool concept for a video game. Like that's a video game that as you describe it right now, I'm like, yo, this, I want to play this. Like if you, if you pitch your next game to me and it, and it was that, I'd be like, yo, I want to It's one that, that I feel, I could, be, I could be getting this wrong. I feel like Gary Witter tried to do a screenplay of it. Like it's one mm. that people from back in the day love and are like, this is such a cool concept. And I've tried to like figure out, is there a way of, that's you awesome. know, bring this back. What's up. it called again? Uh, a Mind Forever Voyaging. A Mind Forever Voyaging. Which is, I think, why it was, it was not a big success commercially, and a name like that yeah. doesn't help, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sam, enough about that. Let's talk about today's stories, which include two new projects coming from Half Mermaid, unfortunate news from Riot, and more, because this is Kind of Funny Games Daily. Each and every weekday, we run you through the nerdy news and you used to know about live on YouTube, Twitch, and podcast services around the globe if you love what we do please support us with the kind of funny membership on patreon or youtube to get all of our shows ad free watch us record them live and get a daily exclusive show uh, for a chance to be a part of the show submit your thoughts and opinions as youtube super chats as we go housekeeping for you we're proud to announce that we've teamed up with the indie exchange for the ultimate uh, spring game showcase the game submission deadline uh, for the mix slash kf spring showcase is february 2nd head to kind of funny.com slash spring showcase to get your game submitted and then two new reviews are up right now. Uh, we got the Tekken 8 review. Uh, that is up as a Kind of Funny Games cast. And our Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth review is up as a Kind of Funny X cast. Uh, those are both over on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games. A new Kind of Funny podcast is up where the crew ranks the days of the week. That's up over on YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny. Uh, and then thank you to our Patreon producer, Delaney Twining. Today we're brought to you by the Kind of Funny membership, but we'll tell you about that later. For now, let's begin with what is and forever will be. Roper report. It's time for some news. We have six stories today. A baker's dozen. Starting <laughs> with our number one. Sam, I came into work today. Yeah. Jen was here. Jen was like, hey, bless, did you see that Sam dropped two new games on Steam? And I was like, no, I didn't. I've not seen this. I literally did it on the tack seat over here. That's what like, you can do that. Just do yeah. you went to your Steam app on your phone yeah. and just click publish. I don't know if this is probably getting me in all sorts of trouble, but like my, my Steam, the Steam account that I access everything through is the same account that I play games on and is also the account my son uses because mm -hmm. he started playing on it and now he has like 300 hours of Terraria on it. Oh my God. So it's very, yeah, so like, That's it, awesome. it gets confused between like, are you trying to play a game, Sam, or like release a game? That, so Jen told me that. I went and looked it, looked it up. I saw Wario64 had a tweet saying that you would- In um, there like, oh. dude, well, I don't know how he does it. Like, I, just, I, just set, I was like, I'm going to set these things live so that when I come off the show or if it comes up during the show that I can mention it and then I'll go and tweet about it later or whatever. But yeah. I guess there's people that scan what's happening. Oh, oh, yeah. So like this morning, it was the thing where that news dropped and I'm like sitting waiting for an article to pop up because Wario had it already. Um, but thankfully, Sal Romano at Gamatsu came through, right? So Half Mermaid Productions teases two new titles called Project C and Project D. Uh, Immortality and Telling Life Studio Half Mermaid Productions has opened Steam pages for two new projects titled Project C and Project D. Here are the provided details and teaser trailers for each. Uh, starting with Project C, gifted with the redacted kaleidoscope, redacted <laughs> future. <laughs> for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know, or shall I know even as also I am known. Project C, and I should clarify that C is then followed by um, a redacted box, right? And so we're I'm not making your job easy, am I here? No, not at all. <laughs> uh, the, there's a C word, I guess. Project C, then a word, uh, is the new cinematic redacted, Sam Barlow, redacted, Half Mermaid, redacted for the first time ever in a video game, and then a bunch of redacted. That is Project C. That first time ever is some cool shit. It's, uh, yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, I do know. you want to tell me what it is? I can't. Yeah. Moving on to Project D, uh, this is the description for, proje for Project D. Something bad, <laughs> redacted. <laughs> some doors, redacted. Some doors, redacted. Home, question mark? Yeah. Project D is a redacted survival horror, redacted Sam Barlow, redacted Half Mermaid. Redacted 1983, redacted nurse, redacted in, redacted, period. Be careful, 
Redacted Nightmare. If you're just tuning in, this is the morning surreal poetry hour with Blessing. Sam, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> what, are you do? what are you doing to us? So we did, we did this with, with Immortality. Uh, we initially teased it as Project A. Uh, and, and then over time, we revealed bits of what was there. And it was like we were talking about this off, off camera, but making the kinds of games I make, it's really hard to tell people about them. Yeah. <laughs> right? You can't be like, hey, check out this early alpha footage. Check out this thing and, and build it up. Because usually there's like some kind of cool layers to the narrative and some conceits. Uh, so we wanted to you know, get some stuff out there and people can start thinking. But also just let people know we're making two games mm -hmm. and one of them is in the tradition of immortality, building on some of that tech, but going in a, a, a cool direction. Mm -hmm. um, I think you look at the Steam tags, you can see that it's like horror, sci-fi horror. It's, it's, it's a very cool premise. Uh, it might be, might be like the chunkiest mechanic we've come up with within this this kind of non-linear space like it's 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 a, a cool little puzzle box oh, yeah. i'm like <laughs> <laughs> you're trying not to spill yeah. too, much, too much of the redacted and then the other project d that is uh for for my like old school fans that played like silent hill shadow memories back in the day mm -hmm. this is uh a, a third person survival horror game but like take that and, and then imagine what happens if the immortality team uses with with a third person survival horror game and oh my god kind of and it's which is it's you know which is a fun thing for me because yeah when i, I made shattered memories did some legacy of kane stuff that didn't come out then went to her story like part of her story was me going uh there there are constraints to making like a third person character driven game that are annoying and i'm going to try and make something that that in some ways is purer or lets me kind of forget about those constraints and so to so now in the 2020s be coming back and seeing you know where the technology is at especially in terms of like character performance mm -hmm. uh you know uh, unreal engine doing some pretty things um but also like you, you forget how rigid like when we made silent hill shadow memories back in the day the, the idea of what a survival horror was was so rigid, right? And Resident Evil kind of then blew that up. Yeah. But, you know, it was like, there should be, a, there should be health kits. There should be this. It was like a very specific game design. Like, I expect to have keys that have funny little insignias on them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's cool to come back and be like, what is the state of the art in third-person character games? How can we blow that up again? Kind of play with it. So, yeah, two fun projects. Are you not uh, tired? Uh, two two games being look, being worked on. This is this is releasing a game on PS5 and having two projects. Yeah, I was gonna say. Go. So today you came through and you're like, let me yeah, let's drop the game on PS5 and then let's drop and retire on PS5 and now let's also announce two games at the same time. Is that what? When you were, I guess, coming up with these uh, ideas, right? When you you in the studio work, we were figuring out like, okay, what do we want to make? And you landed on these two things. Was there a conversation of? Is this too much, or did you already have the bandwidth? Did you, did you know that this is what you wanted to do? I mean, I think this this will will plug into this when we talk about the news from today. Yeah. But like, as as a small indie studio, there's like the, the the dream is to have two things going within the studio, right? So that you're not kind of just in this cycle of one game and, and putting the one game out, and and, and everything. Depends on that one game, but also, you know, the, the, the way resources cycle in and out of a project. So from a, like, really boring, like, practicality standpoint, it's like, oh, if we can figure out a way to have multiple things going on. Um, and then just, like, personally, it was, well, we're doing this, this you know, third-person game in Unreal. Uh, we, we don't want to wait until that project is finished to keep exploring this cool shit we've got going on with Immortality. Yeah. Like, so... You know, both of those ideas were like, it was, it was kind of hard to choose between which of those two ideas to kind of kick off. So figuring out a way of setting up two teams and being like, okay, now we have two teams that are running that can handle these things. They're both very interesting mm -hmm. in their own ways. I mean, this brings me back to um, back in July, I went to preview Armored Core and I got to interview uh, some of the leads of that game. And, you know, one of the questions I asked them was, how does Armored Core fit within the ethos of From Software, right? From Software known as like now a third person action, we're gonna make a Souls-like type thing. It is gonna be this brutal hard game. 
Um, and when I asked them about that, they were like, hey, we don't just want to be known for the Souls likes. We don't want to be known for making this one kind of game. Like, we want to be able to expand and experiment and do different things. And, you know, the Souls like type game is a pillar for From Software, but we don't want it to be the pillar of From Software. And it sounds like for you, it's the similar sort of thing of, hey, like, we've established a pillar here with what we've been doing with her story, Telling Lies and, and uh, Immortality. Now we want to expand out and do a thing that speaks to our passions. I guess for uh, for you looping back to the survival horror part of Project D here, what is, I guess, the, like, you talk about, you know, now we're in a place in 2020, in the 2020s, I guess, where uh, making that type of game is a bit more feasible for where the genre is coming, where technology has come. Is there, like, a big thing with that? Like, is there, I guess, a survival game or a survival horror game or any type of game that you played where you're like, oh, this is now giving me the juice to do this. Like, this is where... Um, like this is where the feel is coming from in terms of oh I can use this mechanic or this technology or um, have this sort of freedom with it. It's probably it's maybe this may be a, a, a bad insight into my process. It's usually the the negative feelings <laughs> motivate me. Like like okay. I'll play I'll play a game and I'm not going to name any names because then I'll come across as, as as mean. But like I'll play a game that is, is is a third person narrative driven game. Okay, and I'll be like I wouldn't have done that. Oh no, no! You should be doing this. Like, like, oh, these are the things that have not changed in ten years. These are the things that need tweaking. Uh, but I and I think alongside that, like, the audience just has such a is so much more educated, right? And, and has played so many more games. And I think you look at stuff like Dark Souls, right? You look at how that went from being this niche little hardcore thing to now being a huge franchise, right? And you, mm -hmm. and you see that there is this acknowledgement that players. I think if there's, if there's a thread that runs through the FMV games, it's like respect the intelligence of the player. Right? Mm -hmm. Like all those games kind of drop you in and say, there's a lot to figure out, go at it. My part of the bargain is we're not gonna like punish you. Like there's no hard game overs in any of those games, right? Like if you just kind of stick with it and follow your curiosity, you'll figure stuff out. And so I think that's probably the most liberating thing is, is looking at the gaming audience now and going, I can put out something that is my take on survival horror and we can do some fairly radical things in terms of the, the player freedom, the expectations of how much the game will, will give to you on a plate. Um, and, and we can kind of run with that. And so I think it's very much, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's me going, there's, there's a space that isn't currently being inhabited that mm -hmm. I think we can do really interesting things in. But I mean, you know, what was it, last year? Uh, I think it was last year? I played like Alan Wake 2. Was it this year? Yeah. No, that was last year. It was last year. What even time? Times the war right? uh, And I think like Alan Wake is not, we're doing things that are in a very different space, but it was very cool to see Remedy just going for it, right? Just giving themselves license to, to be Remedy mm. and to indulge certain ideas. See, I was, I was going to bring up Alan Wake too, because, you know, you talk about survival horror and, um, you know, the, the things that you want to bring to the table when you're looking at, like, your FMV games and, and, and respecting the intelligence of the player and doing different things and expanding, expanding that. Um, you know, Alan Wake 2 was, for me, when I first started playing that game, immediately I was like, oh, this is captivating because it, is, it feels like it's very much trying to do something different that can be done in this space. You know, like, we've come so far with you know, Resident Evil 4 coming through and maybe blowing things up and then getting games like Last of Us and Dead Space and others. And, you know, I think there is this formulaic aspect of, I know what a survival horror game is. I know what I'm going to get out of this thing. Alan Wake 2 definitely broke that up for me in a way where I was refreshed again by the genre. And I think I, I, I might have been talking to Greg or at least when that game first came out, I remember having a conversation with people talking about the same thing of, oh yeah, this feels like it's, actually innovating it feels like it's doing something different it feels like it's taking taking a left turn here um and so yeah like i'm totally down and excited to hear about maybe more survival horror games trying to take left turns with the genre because i think any genre could use that kind of thing yeah i think just just giving yourself permission to be like indulgence probably a bad word but mm -hmm. like when i made immortality it was like all the film directors i loved growing up like ken russell nick rogue these were all people that the critique was like oh it's self-indulgent it's too much right? yeah. these guys there's just too much and I was like, well, I'd rather have too much than too little, right? And, and I was like, it just isn't, because games is so complicated and so risk averse, so much money and effort involved. You don't often see people just swinging for the fences in the same way that like, I think, you know, in its own way, Baldur's Gate did, in its own way, Alan Wake did. And yeah, trying to keep doing things like that. So I got two questions left for you. One comes from uh, a DM, a Slack DM from Greg Miller, who says, can you ask him about the Lost and Cult collab? What's up with this Lost and oh. Cult collab? 
the other fun bit in news today, mm -hmm. uh, if you're already an Immortality fan, uh, or if you're about to become one, thanks to PS5, um, we have this fantastic, it's gorgeous, it's so gorgeous, even I want one, uh, we're putting out, it is this incredible package that is the script for Immortality, sorry, script book for Immortality, mm -hmm. uh, along with some extra behind the scenes stuff uh, put together. It has the individual scripts from the movies. Uh, it has all this cool stuff like photos, posters, ticket stubs from the movies. It has the soundtrack this on vinyl, on CD, on cassette. It's all like within the world of immortality. So it this all has right all the different retro vibes and it's just, ah, it's like gorgeous. That's awesome. Imagine if you got a present from a loved one and you're like, what is this thing? There's this big heavy box and you unwrapped it and you're like, oh shit, this, this would be a fantastic yeah. present. Uh, my last question is, you mentioned uh, Immortality is Project A, and then you just announced Project C and D. What's up with Project B? Project B got shelved, um, not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. um, Project B was uh, Project Bastille. Okay. Looks at this world exclusive right now. Whoa. Uh, live on Kind of Funny. Um, and was <laughs> being like, okay, we pulled off Immortality. We got away with being that indulgent and crazy let's keep going and and we started to sketch the ideas out and it got to the point where i was like maybe this is too much <laughs> like that's fair like is the world ready i don't know we're coming out of a pandemic like everything like that's like kojima like, being like i don't want to predict the future anymore <laughs> you're like the world isn't ready for this one yeah so we might come back it, it was uh yeah it, yeah the bastille like it had hooks into uh like i was uh, like doing immortality and we had like a, uh, uh, costume drama within the game, right. Of Ambrosio. And I was like, ah, oh, it's kind of cool doing costume drama kind of things. And I like had a semi obsession with like the French revolution and, uh, the writers of that period. And I think coming off immortality, I was rereading some of that stuff and I was like, oh man, like th the world has not changed. Right, you're reading contemporary accounts from the 1700s of people complaining about inequalities and, and all the things that are going on in the world. And I'm reading it like this could literally be about today. Mm -hmm. So then I started to get riled up and, and this game kind of came out of it. But I was like, okay, this going, going out and spending all of the money we made from Immortality on you know, a giant costume production and accurate guillotines and things was... Um, like let's let's come back to this idea. Yeah. Sometimes you have that. Like a lot of you know, I'll have ideas, and you're like, oh, this is ninety percent there. Um, and in fact, like Project C was an idea uh, that we actually uh, that's a spoiler. But we we pitched in different forms, or, or kind of talked about in different forms. And it was always like eighty percent there as an idea in my head. I was like, this is a cool idea, but doesn't like, yeah. click in my head. Uh, so that stayed on the shelf. And then at some point it was like, oh no, this is the key to unlocking it. And suddenly you're like, this is a game. Like this has everything to it. So Project B mm -hmm. will sit there and we can come back to it. That's if, awesome. we, if we make a ton of money off these two games, then I can go spend it all on period procs. Give Sam money. <laughs> Sam makes some good, good games. And so I'm curious and I want to know what Project B is. That sounds really cool. Uh, we're going to move on. Some sad news. But before we get there, I want to tell you about patreon.com slash kind of funny. Over on Patreon and with kind of funny membership on YouTube, you can get the show ad free. And speaking of ads, let us tell you about our sponsors. Kind of Funny turns nine years old today. And we could have made it nine days without your support. That's why 2024 is all about doubling down on our shows and making it simpler than ever for you to get the most out of our content. Our revamped Kind of Funny membership is your one-stop shop for all our amazing content, which now includes on a weekly basis, the Kind of Funny podcast, In Review, the Kind of Funny games cast, PS I Love You XOXO, the Kind of Funny X cast, the brand new series Kind of Funny Game Showdown. Five episodes of Kind of Funny Games Daily and five exclusive Greg Way vlogs. And five days of streaming fun with me and the gang here in our newly revamped streaming space. It's going to be filled with a ton of laughter and a whole lot of shenanigans. We'll see you there. That's more than 20 pieces of content a week from an 11 person independent team in San Francisco. That's a lot. And to get the most out of it, 
all we're asking for is ten dollars ten dollars gets you the kind of funny membership and that entitles you to ad free versions of the shows the ability to watch the podcast live as we record them and the exclusive access to my daily show greg way you can get your kind of funny membership on patreon.com slash kind of funny or youtube.com slash kind of funny games yes we are expanding our kind of funny membership offering to youtube so people can take full advantage of the platform they prefer. If you want to go above and beyond the Kind of Funny membership to support us, we will still have higher Patreon tiers, albeit with some changed up perks. We just wanted to make the message as clear as possible that the $10 Kind of Funny membership is for the masses to get all the core content people love. Everything above that is very appreciated. The support means the world to us. You all are the best. But... The $10 Kind of Funny membership available on both Patreon.com slash Kind of Funny and YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games is where we see the value of what we do. Kind of Funny is a dream come true and we wouldn't have it without you. We hope if you've ever enjoyed the content, you can support us for at least a month as we prepare for our biggest year ever. Until next time, it's been our pleasure to serve you. And we're back with story number two. Riot lays off 530 staff and Riot Forge is shutting down. This is Marie de Alessandri at GamesIndustry.biz. League of Legends developer Riot Games has announced that it's laying off 11% of its workforce, representing 530 employees. The layoffs primarily impacted uh, teams outside of core development. CEO uh, Dylan Jadeja uh, said in a lengthy update on Riot's website. The employees affected will receive a minimum of six months of severance pay, a cash bonus, and extensive support, including hardware if needed, uh, job placement services, additional pay for health insurance, and more. The company also announced that the scope of Legends of Runeterra is being reduced, as well as the end of its publishing label, Riot Forge, which was focused on titles set in the League of Legends universe. Riot Forge will be shut down after the release of Bandle Tale, due to launch on February 24th. Jadeja also explained the logic behind the redundancies, uh, saying that Riot had made a, quote, number of big bets, end quote, since 2019, expanding its portfolio and leading the company to double it, its size within a few years. Quote, today, we're a company without a sharp enough focus. And simply put, we have too many things underway, Jadeja added. Quote, some of the significant investments we've made aren't paying off the way we expected them to. Our costs have grown to the point where uh, they're unsustainable, and we've left ourselves no room for experimentation or failure, which is vital to create to a creative company like ours. All of this puts the core of our business at risk, end quote. The company tried to course correct, Jadeja added, reducing scope on projects, reducing cost, and implementing hiring slowdowns. But Jadeja said these changes, quote, weren't enough, end quote. Sam, over the last half year, it feels like we've had a limitless number of big layoffs announced, right? And that's been going over the course of like the last two years, but especially within the last few months, it, it's sped up and ballooned up. And, it, and now that we're in January, January alone has had some big layoffs. Um, have you been keeping your eye on all this? Like, is, has this yeah, been, we have like a you in any sp uh, specific way? We have like a Slack channel in our team where <laughs> we just like track all of these. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very depressing. Um, it's weird as well because like there have been you know it's a cyclical industry uh i think like games is is a semi-broken industry because we look at movies and we're like oh well it's similar to movies right movies cost a lot of money mm -hmm. can make a lot of money you know creative endeavors so there's risk um but there's something weird about like movies are very agile to some extent but with games when you're like oh we need like 100 people sat in a room for five years to make this thing and, and you're shooting for targets and things of, it, it, it's way more complicated. Mm -hmm. But there was a period, you know, where the, that cyclical thing was kind of semi healthy, right? Where uh, certainly, like in the UK scene, when I made her story, you would see layoffs and people, if, if it was, you know, they had a good package, they got severance. Sometimes you'd see it seed like little bursts of cool indie stuff, right? Where it'd be like, oh, there's a bunch of people who've worked together, developed skills together. Now they have a little window to try and go make something cool. And it was also happening back then when it was a bit easier to get attention in the indie space. Whereas now, like, how, do you, how does the industry absorb 500 jobs to, just yeah. today, right? Like, Where do these that, people go? Yeah. You know? I mean, obviously, some of them are going to leave the industry. Um, I mean, I, every programmer I know is aware that if they go into banking, they can make three times as much money. Yeah. Right? And if you have family becomes a point where you're like, am I going to move again for my games job or do I just 
you know, take something that, that, yeah. that I don't quite have the same passion for, but is going to help pay. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's been kind of gross and it's, and, and all of these bigger companies, you look at it and it's like, oh, this was like a rounding error, right? This was them going, this is our contingency. This is our, our planning. We're mm -hmm. going to see this, this amount of growth, but our growth was 1% off our targets. So we have to lose 500 people, right? It's yeah. that level of, of, Good, good catch right there. <laughs> <I'm so mad. laughs> um, yeah, it's it's just kind of gross from from the the human perspective that this is how things are done, and it feels like it doesn't need to be this way. I mean, like Embracer oh my last God. year. And yeah, that one, it, I mean, you want to talk about an unforced error? Well, you, you're sat there looking at that, and you're like, kind of seems like Embracer's just buying stuff up, yeah, willy nilly with no real plan what to do with it, and it's going to break at some point. And they're like, no, no. I mean, the, you you see the CEO, the quotes from him, and he's like. Everyone says that at some point this is going to explode. It's not. We have a plan, right? And you just see it again and again and again, yep. and then it falls over. And, you know, when you hear quotes like that where it's a CEO coming out and going, we screwed up. <laughs> we, we made all these bad choices, and, and now 500 people lose their jobs. Yeah. It, just, it, it seems really easy from our perspective to look up and be like, well, yeah. yeah. Right? Like, this, this wasn't our world that we created. You guys created it. I, there was a, uh, I mean, obviously there were so many people were tweeting yesterday about this because uh, later, later yesterday is when this news broke. Uh, one of the tweets I saw was from Imran Khan, who's one of the smartest people I know, who tweeted out, I feel at some point recently a bubble burst in the games industry, as bubbles tend to do, but I can't identify what the hell bubble we were supposed to be in that was unsustainable. And then he got a, a reply from a guy named uh, Josh uh, Kowanik who said, uh, pre-COVID market forecasts were for around 5% market growth forever. After COVID market uh, forecasts kept around 5% growth on a baseline that was around 30% higher than it was forecasted to be, companies are coming to term with low, low single digit growth. 2026 plus forecasts have come down 15% uh, plus. And then I, there was a quote tweet of that from Matt Piscatella, one of the other smartest people I know, who like, you know, uh, Matt works for Circana, who do a lot of like the numbers tracking in the industry. Um, and when I say Matt works from Circana, he's the executive director at Circana. Uh, they he, work for him. Yeah, they work for him. <laughs> uh, he quote tweeted that and says, that pretty much sum sums it up. Folks forget just how meteoric growth was in 2020 uh, through 2021, and companies had heaps of cheap money to invest, and they did. Now we are seeing market growth basically hovering under inflation, and money got very expensive. So I think it's the idea that like during COVID, obviously so many people came to games, and you saw during that couple-year period, the numbers were outrageous. Like the amount of people that were playing Animal Crossing, the amount of people that were playing like all these different games, uh, you saw so much growth. You saw so much hardware sales, software sales. And now that we are quote unquote post COVID, right? Like not post COVID, but you know what I mean in terms yeah. of what the market is, um, things are bouncing back and companies weren't prepared for things to bounce back the way, the way they are. Um, and now we're here. And I think it's that combined with just how many video games that, um, that are coming out, how many video games, uh, games and services are trying to vie for people's attention. We talked about this last year with Bungie and how um, you saw Bungie ha had layoffs because of Destiny numbers not being where they wanted it to be. We look at Riot being in a, 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 I think a company that we view in a similar um, way where it is, you know, if you would ask me how Riot's doing, I'd be like, oh, I'm sure they're doing fucking great because <laughs> yeah. it's League of Legends. It's League of Legends combined with all the other stuff they have going on. Um, you know, Valorant, et cetera, uh, let alone, yeah, like the um, uh, Riot Forge stuff that, you know, seems has been, it seems like that stuff has been doing well for what it is, right? Going to smaller developers going, hey, we have League of Legends, make something small with it, and them doing that, and those games coming out and being critical successes. It seems like Riot has been on the up and up in terms of quality and at least audience being there and supporting them financially. So the fact that you see them now in January 2024 go, yeah, we're going to lay off 11% uh, of our workforce. It's like, what the fuck is happening? And, you know, I think it's always um, that stuff I just mentioned about 20, uh, 2020 through 2021, but then also just how much attention does the audience have, right? How much uh, bandwidth does the audience have to play League and Destiny? But this, and I mean, again, like things. this is like we know this, right? Like, yeah. like even in the midst of COVID, we're all playing Animal Crossing. Everything's, you know, everyone's playing games. If you had said to me, here's a hundred million dollars, I would not have banked on people still playing Animal Crossing every day. Yeah. At post that, right? Like there was obviously an opportunity for them to do number stuff and money stuff that was taking risks that they shouldn't have taken. The live service thing, speak to every game dev, they're like, you can only play one or two of those games yeah religiously 
not every game can be a live service game. Uh, and it, it does feel like, you know, those dev times are really long. It takes so long for the message to get from the grassroots up to the exec level or from the audience to the exec level. And you saw it with NFTs, mm -hmm. uh, saw it with the metaverse, all that stuff where the, the point where the, the venture capitalists and the bosses were going, NFTs is the big thing for us, right? In mm -hmm. games or the metaverse. And very quickly, people in the industry were saying, this isn't the thing, dude. And then very quickly, the audience was kind of going, actually, eh. But it still takes like a year, two years to turn that ship around for the execs to be like, oh, actually, yeah. Sorry, we shouldn't have spent a billion dollars on NFT games. Yeah. Like, so for you, where do you see this going, I guess, long term? I know it's so impossible to tell, even, even um, especially since we're in the midst of it. It feels like we're in the middle and if maybe not still in like the first half of it, which is really scary to think about. But when you look down a few years, uh, a few years from now, like in your, in, uh, your Slack channel, like... Are we? Are you guys talking about the long, long-term implications of this? Are you guys talking about like, oh, man, like, what is this going to do to the games industry? Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I know it's a I, very grim. I, topic. I would be being as, uh, as silly as the CEOs if I was going to make any concrete predictions, right? Because yeah. their job is going. Oh, this is what's going to happen. Therefore, we'll do this. Uh, I mean, from our perspective, like we're out in this big sea of game development, and there's these giant you know, uh, giant carrier ships that are all sinking or a bunch of Titanics, all this chaos happening. And we're in our little indie dinghy trying to ping around. Yeah. And it might be good for us here where we can like pick up a bunch of survivors who are jumping off this ship and, and whatever. But it's yet yeah, very much to us, it feels like how do we keep doing our cool thing in the midst of all this, this larger noise, right? I mm -hmm. guess the, the biggest trend for me uh, is going to be how we handling this this transition that has had stops and starts in terms of like subscription right i think that because that's what everyone cares about is the forever money right they the game the games of service is exciting to the ceos because they know they get more money from people paying every month and buying battle passes and extra things than they ever did from just the effort of having to convince someone to buy the yeah the seventy dollar thing. I mean that goes back to the last year. There was a um, like a PlayStation uh, or Sony like presentation where they showed off like these slides, and the slides were talking about how much money they want to invest into doing live service type games as opposed to like the strategy that they have they have had in the before, like focusing on the single player big budget uh, type stuff. And it is like in that slide, there was a slide that was saying, "Hey, this is how much money that games that we make selling games full price." This is how much money that the industry is making right now through live service. And you look at those two numbers and even PlayStation, which you look at PlayStation Studios and they're putting out bangers of first, par of first party, single player, big budget action games. And even them, like they, they go, oh man, yeah, look at the live service stuff. We need to make that kind of money. And it's, it's I mean, the Sony thing is a good example, right? Because it's, it's like what Netflix has been doing, right? And Netflix yeah. broke television by showing up with VC money and going, we can make these really expensive shows and we can give them to you all in one lump. And then everyone was like, oh, we have to, now everyone has to have their own streaming service. Mm -hmm. And a streaming service has to have a whole bunch of amazing shows. And Apple knows they have to spend X million dollars an episode to compete. And like when we saw during the actor strike, there's this realization that actually no one's making any money, right? Like th that isn't, you know, it's, it's the VC driven model of you need to just steal all the attention. You need to disrupt the industry. And then we'll figure out how to make money from it. Yeah. And I feel like games has been the same with live service, right? If, if you can be Riot and you can be at the top of that, have the biggest live service games going, they're still internally trying to figure out, like, how do we actually make good, reliable money from this thing, right? We have the attention. We have all the players. We've created this distorted market. Like, if uh, all the, the Spider-Man stuff, right? Like, if Spider-Man 2 costs $300 million to make, Last of Us is $250 million. Like, we've set that precedent now, and, and that from Sony has disrupted your expectation of what, a triple a game is mm -hmm. so suddenly if you are an embracer right and you're going oh we're going to be competing at that level so we're going to buy this studio and they need to make a game that's as good as last of us mm -hmm. and then the people there are going well we need 250 million dollars to make that and that's actually you know that's 250 million dollars for a studio that's been doing this thing for five years yeah horribly distorted and uh, it's it's also hard to walk back from right like if netflix turned around and went actually I mean, to be fair, HBO is doing this right <laughs> with Max. They're like, actually, maybe we don't put shows out anymore. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we just film them and then delete them. 
uh, or we cancel them. But it's very hard to walk back. You know, if Sony went from now on, all of our blockbuster titles are going to be $100 million games. And there's going to be less in them, and there'll be less cool incidental animations. And you know, yeah. that wouldn't work, right? So it's, it's real tricky. But I mean, yeah, the games are service. Um, I, you know, I think we've seen it with Game Pass, right? The idea that let's get people paying a subscription price. And it has huge advantages to someone like me. Um, like all the subscription services get excited when I come into the room because they're like, oh, we, we have our roguelikes, we have our FPSs, we have the racing game. Oh, if we get the weird, <laughs> cool Sambala game yeah. that people can be obsessed with for 20 hours, that's great in our portfolio uh, and, and makes sense for everybody financially. Um, so it, it kind of works for me and having that level of, of kind of awareness around my games means I can go into those conversations. And you know, for me, I hate charging people any money for my games. Like it's still a weird thing when you're like, hey. You want people to experience your art. Yeah, and like, what is the price of a game? Like, you know, truthfully, what we spent on it and how mm -hmm. much effort went into it, you could charge $50 for immortality, yeah. right? And, and I've, you could pay $70 for a game that lasts about the same amount of time, Yeah. right? It's, so it's very hard to put a price on it. And, and so that's like an uncomfortable thing. But so the idea of subscription kind of makes sense to me. And, and maybe we will see a shift towards that, right? Like, so Sony doesn't have to make the, the, the $250 million Last of Us game. It can still put all that money in there, but spread it over different periods or like how you come to that game be different. Mm -hmm. um, but I think yeah. what, what they're betting on is like, hey, if we can make a couple of these games as service or live service games stick, and that'll hopefully fund the 250 million games that we're making over at Sony Santa Monica or, or with um, um, Naughty Dog. Um, and it's, like, like it, I mean, it comes back to what we're talking, the overall thing of what we're talking about, where it is a weird time right now uh, in terms of video game money and how we're spending it and how it's going around. And I, like, I mean, to the, uh, Imran's th tweet of, like, what bubble just burst? Like, what is, what is happening? I am fascinated slash a bit scared of what like is there a big a bigger bubble that's like ready to burst that is going to I, like a, I don't like a to, big ass crash like like, like a, big a kind ass of crash yeah ET in the desert like i'm not trying, i'm not trying to be like oh we're all good <laughs> we're all in trouble or like oh everything's gonna go down i'm not gonna be that, like that about it but i am like what happens like how do we fix this like what are we what's going to happen so that we don't have that happen um and i'm curious on what that is but keeping within the same subject matter though story number three Game industry leader predicts 2024 will be the year of closures. This is Tom Ivan at VGC. I promise we're not going to be in the sad ter territory forever. Game industry leaders have suggested that widespread job losses across the market last year will continue throughout 2024 and likely stretch into next year too. Game developer Farhan Noor, uh, who has been tracking job cuts uh, dating back to the start of 2023 on VideoGameLayoffs.com, estimates that around uh, 10,500 games industry employees were laid off last year. In less than a month into 2024, some 3,000 planned job cuts are already thought to have been confirmed. And I think this article might have been published before the right thing. And so add like 500 more to that. Speaking of GamesIndustry.biz anonymously, senior industry figures uh, warned that more tough times are in store for the market due to continued high interest rates and an, over, or an overabundance of uh, new releases and cautious investors. Quote, if 2023 was the year of layoffs, 2024 will be the year of closures, according to one CEO of a, company, of a public company. Uh, not just developers, uh, but publishers, media, service companies. There are just too many unprofitable businesses in video games, they added. We're looking at up to two years of pain, end quote. Uh, our publisher boss said, quote, uh, or sorry, one publisher boss said, quote, uh, too many games were greenlit in 2020 and 2021. We need to get to pre-pandemic levels in terms of release schedule, and that's probably going to take two years. Uh, you can already see publishers signing fewer games. That's happening everywhere. Uh, the stores are saturated. Uh, not just Steam and the games uh, just aren't delivering the levels they were, end quote. I know I just said that I don't want to be alarmist, <laughs> and I just read a very, an article that feels very like, oh, man, <laughs> like all is kind of is, is kind of scary right now. But um, I mean, what's your, read on, what's your read on what's going on here and what's being said here? Yeah, um, and like I say, it, it, if you look back, it, things have always been cyclical, right? And we have this weird thing in video games where we're so tied to hardware cycles as well that creates this addi additional stress level, mm -hmm. right? Like if movie theaters had to reinvent movie theaters every five years, it would create this extra pain point. Um, so like the, the hardest I've seen it 
prior to this point was, was the, that was when I went indie, uh, mm -hmm. right? We were working on a game that was for PS3 and the PS4 was, was on the horizon and free to play games had blown up. This, this was like coming off of like phone gaming, free to play on phones and all the publishers and investors were going, we could spend all this money on a, a, a cool ass console game but look at all this infinite money that is happening over here in Candy Crush or whatever. Infinite wealth. And what they didn't realize was, you know, if you see this infinite revenue curve on a free-to-play game, they're putting 99% of that money in acquisition, right? Like it was, there was a whole engine to it. Um, and it was, it was weird because the, the publishers were really scared. It was a similar thing. We'd had, uh, you know, I remember like we'd, we'd come off like Bioshock and stuff had come out. There was this idea that premium single player games were this really cool thing that, that was like the, the prestige title you'd have in your portfolio. And at that transition, all the publishers I spoke to, including the ones that were funding our game, were like, we're not sure gamers are going to make the leap from PS3 to PS4. We're not mm -hmm. sure we can keep spending, or in fact, spend more money on the same games for this transition. Obviously, um, people did make that transition and now we're seeing like ps5 is selling in record numbers so you know we yeah it's it's hard to imagine anything too catastrophic happening because i feel like there are there is like a rhythm that we're into now yeah um obviously at some point people are going to have to figure out what's next for playstation like what's the next machine um and and those create these extra difficult points i mean like the transition to like the PS5 era was the first kind of incremental one, right? I feel like where I, I think that's fair. I was Perfect. playing, you know, playing God of War on PS4. I don't have like a 4K TV. And then jumping to God of War on PS5 and being like, well, you know, like, it, it, it if fair? I don't put my glasses on, like essentially the game, it's the same game yeah. experience. I mean, it's right? the reason why everybody was like up in arms when the last was two remastered came out or was announced because people were like, what, what are you remastering? Like, what, like you look at these two games, I've been seeing like people put side by sides on Twitter and I am like, all right, the side by sides don't really do much for me. Like, I'm just like, yeah, okay, cool. I'm here for the roguelike mode and that's really it. But yeah, like I think you're right in terms of the, uh, the incremental thing compared to, I think, going from PS3 to PS4. Like I remember picking up GTA 5 on PS4 and like, Again, not a crazy jump, but it was a big enough jump of like, okay, no, the frame rate here looks better. Like the 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 um like there's a better resolution here. Like I can kind of feel the jump here as opposed to in the last couple of generations. Yeah, like God of War, Miles Morales, the games that are making the cross generational thing are like, all right, cool. You know, like I guess the game has a performance mode on one console, so that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel like that that kind of apocalyptic thing. Like you'd have to see one of the big companies shut down, right? Yeah. You'd have to have like a Microsoft go. Do you know what? we're out of games, yeah. which it feels like at this point, games are so embedded and, and this so kind of enmeshed in all the, the sexy things, the metaverse, yeah. you know, but I think, well, I don't know. I mean, to what you're talking about before in terms of expectations, right? Like PlayStation putting out these $250 million games and all these things. I think it, it is going to be the thing of, I think as years go, we're, we're going to see less games. Like the article uh, mentioned here, right? The quote talking about how less games are getting uh, greenlit now. I think the audience might have to, yeah, reckon with both seeing less games and maybe seeing games that, yeah, aren't maybe going to be that expensive outside of coming from maybe a, a select few publishers. Like I think Sony might still continue to do the, no, we want to put out these $250 million games from Sony Santa Monica and Naughty Dog because... I, I think that is what makes PlayStation PlayStation. Like without that, yeah, you, you have they start to, to right? lose it's that like when, when people, I saw people were digging into that new story and they were like, how do you spend this much money on a game? Mm -hmm. And it was like, that's the wrong way to look at the question because at some point they're being told you have to spend this money. Yes. Right? Like if, if like you delivered, they don't spend you delivered Spider-Man 2 for a hundred million dollars and, and it, it got one less point on Metacritic, someone at Sony would be going, why did we not, why are we not making the best game ever? Like why did we hold back? Why didn't we, put the time in or the money or yeah. whatever. So I feel like they, they have to, um, I mean, for me, I would love to see, and, and maybe we are seeing a reemergence of the double A, right? Which is the, whatever we used to call it. Yeah. The, you know, the smaller game. And I think certainly like when I did her story in 2014, 15, it wasn't viable. I don't think for me, uh, to go make a, a more traditional looking video game from a kind of indie perspective, like the, the technology didn't make sense. The numbers didn't make sense. The size of the audience didn't make sense. But I feel like now, especially with things like Game Pass, 
it's like oh no we can we can make something really cool and i think you saw like i, I don't this is not double a by any standard but like kojima's death stranding mm -hmm. right you see control from remedy these yeah. were not last of us budget games right but they were not like micro budget indie games and they would make you know taking choices that were interesting and yeah i mean i think you look at hi-fi rush last year and that's a good example of i you know that game looks great it plays great it's also eight hours long and you get it off game pass <sighs> and it doesn't feel like you are breaking the bank a, to play this a sub 10 hour game is my dream i know i mean that's why i got excited when hellblade 2 was announced as going to be the same length as the previous game and i'm like yes <laughs> like that my, right now i don't i don't want to i i feel almost shitty saying that there are too many video games coming out because i think people should make the video games they want to right like i think everybody should like everybody who wants to make a video game should have the ability to make a video game right and that should be able to, to come out and do that thing but like I look at last year and I look at even uh, this year, right now, the month of January and right now in the month of January going into February, I can't play all the games I want to play. Like I look around and I'm like, all right, Yakuza is coming out. Uh, uh, Persona 3 Reloads around the corner. I'm uh, Tekken 8 is coming out and we have a review. I've played, I'm, I'm playing a lot of Tekken 8, right? Um, and uh, like last, I couldn't play any of uh, Last of Us uh, 2 Remastered just because there's just so much happening. I'm still, I'm on like a bunch of juries and I'm still playing uh, Final Fantasy Jedi and Hogwarts because yeah. I, I need to get through them on the, the long list, whatever. But. And if, I think you look at that, you look at the audience and how much is competing for people's attention. And I think, I, I personally, I wouldn't mind less, <laughs> less games coming out. Like if you were to cut the amount of games coming out by half, I think I'd have a better time. I think I'd be able to play more of what I want to and play the games that I like even more. Keep, keep the numbers, just make them shorter. I, too. I do a that terrible too, job yeah. of this. My goal, and I think I'm getting further from this every game I make, is like, can you sit and play this game in a in an evening? Yeah. Right. Like my some of my fondest gaming memories, uh, it, like finishing Silent Hill two at three a.m., uh, finishing Killer Seven at like two a.m. Like games that I start mm -hmm. of an evening, I'm like I'll you know I'll get it so far, and then I'm like, do you know what? I think if I keep playing, I'm gonna get through it. Right. Mm -hmm. And 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 just having that intensity of focus and just that intense experience. And yeah. You come out on the other end, I'm like, oh, I can't go to sleep now. Like. Dude, well, I think it was uh, at the day after Thanksgiving last year where I came home and I finally booted up Venba and I didn't know how long Venba was um, but I started playing and I beat it I think the day after like it was like a two-day thing for me I played two hours one day and two hours the next day um, finished it and it was such a special experience because I was like wow like I got to actually play through this whole video game and I love it and like I think like I, I, I want I do hope that becomes more of a conversation more of a viable conversation even within like the big AAA publishers of Hey, yeah. What if we made like games that could be eight hours? What if play? What if PlayStation First Party was to put out more games that were the, like the miles? The per hour? only DLC I would pay for is the make this game half as long DLC. Right? Yeah. I, I boot up a new game and it's like DLC available. Boom, 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 boom. Extra side quests. Right. I'm just I'm playing Final Fantasy 16. Yeah. And I'm like, part of me is like I have to do the side quests, <laughs> and then part of me is like everyone's telling me you don't need to do the side quests. Yeah. You can skip most of those. Side and then it's like, ding, DLC available. I'm like, I don't want another 30 hours of this game. Yeah. I, I want to have this thing visit me be intense and, and fun and then be done um i want to bring in some youtube super chats of course y'all can write in uh using the youtube super chats to get your questions read right on the show or, or comment on the stories that we're talking about uh dear six lit uh gives us a super chat and says been wanting f uh, for it to come to ps5 and just bought it thank you for finally porting it talking about immortality there you go yeah, um enjoy. bean charlie arts writes in and says love the work y'all do thank you so much bean um irish nexus says marvel snaps new card grandmaster is out today so there you go if you're a, Mar you're a marvel snap player go grab that card moving on to story number four uh we may have death straining 2's full title this is tom ivan at video games chronicle the full title of kojima productions death straining sequel appears to have leaked highly highly reliable data miner bill bill coon claims that the game is called death straining 2 on the beach According to the leaker, fans shouldn't have to wait long to receive official confirmation, as a new reveal for the game is said to be imminent. While they couldn't provide an exact date for the product announcement, they es estimate it'll be made within the next 15 days. I could see this being a state of play or something like that. I think that'd be a, 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 a fun thing. I'm also just looking forward to Death Stranding 2, and so I hope it's around the corner. If they're about to announce the, the name of it, then... I, I like, like that name. I'm thinking, you know, uh, a lot of Japanese RPGs will have like the, the spin off of the DLC where I like all the characters go to the beach and just yeah. hang out in bikinis and, and, I like and stuff. The idea I'm of like, Norman Venus. Is, yeah, it's like Death Stranding 1, very grim. Like, there's a vibe. In this one, 
everyone just goes to the beach. It's like anime, bless. There's always got to be a beach episode. Yeah, a Death Stranding beach episode would be the funniest thing of all time. Because yeah. yeah, that game is so grim and so like fucked up, but also kind of sweet. Like that game, I, I really connected with Death Stranding because like at the core of its uh, themes is this idea of connection and bringing people together and all this stuff. So I like the idea that after just the journey of Death Stranding 1, Kojima's like, let's make a game that is kind of like the calm down after it and just hanging out on the beach with, with uh, Norman Reedus and um, I forget all the names of the characters. Mama and um, Die, Die, Hard. Die Hard Man. Baby. Yeah, <laughs> Die Hard Man, yeah. Um, well, what was the fucking um, the Guillermo del Toro's character name? Was that? No, that, was, that wasn't Die Hard Man. He had like some other crazy name. I guess all of them yeah. have crazy names. They do. Is there a character named Baby? I guess there was a Baby is the thing. Cool. Looking forward to Death Stranding too. Dead Man, thank you. And this Fragile. Or Fragile. Yeah, they pronounce fra- it both ways in the game. <laughs> what a video game. Story number five, uh, a pastel pink Joy-Con set will launch alongside Princess Peach Showtime. Uh, this was announced uh, by Nintendo. Uh, they put up a tweet showing off the, the Joy-Cons, and the Joy-Cons look very cute. I actually kind of want these. These look cool. Oh, look at that. Beautiful photography. Yeah. It's like an Instagram an Instagram For post. Of, that's the, the ideal, the platonic ideal of an Instagram Joy-Con post. They also um, revealed a couple of new transformations and a new trailer. I'm going to pull from IGN for this one. In the new trailer, you can see two, uh, the two latest transformations confirmed. You're getting Ninja Peach and Cowgirl Peach. The former showed gameplay of Peach partaking in stealthy attacks and jumping up walls to progress to higher ground. The latter has Peach equipped with a lasso rope to attack enemies and a snippet of a chase sequence where she is on horseback going after a group of enemies. Is uh, Princess Peach Showtime? Is that like one that piques your interest? Is this one that is this I had the last one. I, I had the one. Uh, so I'm like a huge, like Nintendo's my thing. Fuck yeah, um, love that. And that's the bit people sometimes get surprised because they're like, "Oh, you make all these intense narrative things," and they're like, "What's the biggest inspiration of your games?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's Zelda and Mario." Like, look, at, awesome. look at the way the structure works in Breath of the Wild. I'm talking about the the jump and run controls in Mario. How do you make a, mov- a movieola version of that? Like, you know how Nin- uh, Nintendo gave the folks that did um, uh, Crypto Crypto the Necro Dancer. Yes, that's the, name? The, the, the Zelda. They did the, the Zelda game. one. Um, oh, what was it called? I had the name of it that I lost it. But they had yeah, the like Cadence the, of Hyrule. Thank yeah. you. They have they made Cadence of Hyrule. If Nintendo came to you and they were like, "Hey, choose one of our IPs for a Sam Barlow type." Oh game. man, I. have is, I, I don't know if I'm breaking things to say. I might have had some of those chats and pitched some of those things. Oh, really? Uh, I'll answer for him. Luigi. Luigi's Mansion. No, it would be... Uh, people that follow intensely will know that, like, Metroid Prime, the, uh, the reflection in the visor yeah. that happens in that game was an indirect inspiration of her story. And, and you know, oh, I'm, That makes so much sense. I'm I like, never put that together. I'm, I wouldn't want to touch Zelda. Right, because I just love Zelda so much, and I'm like, they've got that. They know what they're doing. Uh, similarly, Mary, I'm like that. I'd love that thing. I, I wouldn't know where to start. Well, I would, but <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I know what I. I, yeah. I want um, Pokemon game. Whereas like Metroid, I'm like, oh, I Party could game. carve something out there. Um, but yeah, I, I played the original Princess Peach game where she could cry. It was, it was one oh, of those where you're like, yeah. is this subverting the tropes or is this just leaning heavily into some sexist tropes where she could. Like the, the, the special power of Princess Peach was that she could be emotional. Yeah. <laughs> and, it you know, weird. Uh, and I remember trying to play it with uh, one of my kids who was quite young at the time. I feel like that at some point they were like, can we just play Mario? Can we just, can we just, just play the other games? Um, but this one, like they're clearly, clearly that... They're, they're like trying to that, make yeah. her more of a fleshed out character and yeah. like not repeat the sins of the past with that past, past Nintendo or past Princess Peach game. Um... I'm also I'm excited for this even especially coming off of the Mario movie because I really like what they did with mm-hmm. Peach's character in there uh, as well, right? Like, yeah, make her badass, make her cool, like make, make this a character that you know isn't like doesn't just serve the purpose of getting kidnapped and then Mario having to save her. Um, slowly, slowly making steps towards that playable Zelda. Oh yeah, finally close the loop. I was when people are like, I'm playing Zelda, they are actually playing yeah. Zelda. Um, what about Earthbound? Have you ever thought about what you do with an Earthbound? Oh. I just want somebody to do something with an Earthbound. Earthbound was like one of the best gaming experiences I had with my son. So he was, he was like at the age where I was using it as a stealth way to teach him math. So every time we had a fight, he would have to do the math of the leveling up or whatever. That's smart. I like that. But it was also just such a cool game. And there's, there's a point in that game where uh, there's the coffee song, like the weird alien creatures. 
you drink some special coffee and they do this really cool song with this awesome like midi music and the song's all about becoming an adult and as a child going out and becoming your own true self or something mm -hmm. i remember playing that on the couch with my little son and just being like oh my god this is like i don't know if he'll remember this <laughs> but like this is such a moment like i yeah. love just the just the vibes and the soul in that game and like all the story when you you read about like what itoi san like his his in fact i oh no that's i can't talk about that <laughs> <laughs> i love yeah, seeing you navigate like oh man i can't say that I just, just gotta be careful because like I'm not like a huge, you know, I'm a very minor video gaming personage, but I, sometimes I can say things and then they become clickbait. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then people just are like, it, should you, you know? be talking about that, Sam? Um, but no, make, but last... Make this the place where you overshare. Last time I was in Japan, I had dinner with some of my favorite hero devs from who've been doing stuff for a long time. And they were telling me some behind the scenes stuff of like the story of how Itoi got into gaming and he was brought under consult for like this idol game. Mm -hmm. that i think nintendo was doing that was and, and and it's just fascinating seeing someone like that who has this intense love of games but isn't a game dev coming in and being like here are some cool ideas i have and then having like miyamoto and people helping him sculpt that into and then you had like iwata was like instrumental in executing on earthbound so you have like these incredible like what a, an amazing confluence of things that you have this guy is like and i'm gonna put loads of rip-off beatles songs in this game such a cool game i've still i i bought like the japanese version of mother three at a time when i was trying to learn japanese mm -hmm. convinced myself that playing a jrpg on a game boy was going to be the best way to test my skills it's probably not a bad way it's a terrible way because because <laughs> you're trying to learn the kanji uh -huh. right and you're looking at an eight by eight sprite mm -hmm. of a kanji mm -hmm. and you're like how many strokes like what with your kanji dictionary I, uh, and I you're, got, you're, you're learning like fire spells. I got like an hour into, cause I also, I got like the reissue of mother, mother one, two in Japan. And, and I was like, well, this will be simpler. Cause it's like a NES game, right? Mm -hmm. Got an hour into that game. I thought I was attempting to find a brothel to save a ghost from a devil. I'm like, this is making no sense. I Google and it's like the mayor has asked you to find his lost daughter. And I'm like, well, I totally mistranslated. Like, so <laughs> Got nowhere. I, I, I love those games. Yeah, I, I Earthbound. Uh, Earthbound, I think, is responsible for like a lot of my gaming tastes. Like when I look at when I, um, I guess, look at like new indie JRPG style games mm -hmm. that are coming out. Like if it's anything like Earthbound, it's going to pique my interest, right? Like, I think that's part of why I love Undertale so much. That's part of what like when Live Alive came out the other year. Um, like I started playing it, not knowing much about Live Alive, and it as soon as I started playing it and realized that it's goofy, I was like, "Yeah, this is what I want." I like the, the conversation it's in with Pokemon as well. Like a lot of the yeah. stuff that's really chill about Pokemon, or especially the original games of like just that JRPG, but it's in a real world, and you're just like going into office buildings, and there'll be some guy who has like two lines of dialogue that are just super interesting. Yeah, right? that vibe. Yeah, I love it. Earthbound. Well, uh, that's a lot of big news we just talked about, but. Sam, if I wanted something smaller, say the tiniest news I needed to know about, uh -huh. where would I go? Huh. I would say uh, you'd go to our last story, the Wii News Channel, where we cover all the small news items you need to know about. Nailed it. Absolutely nailed it, Sam. Story number six. We got some Wii News for you. Uh, this comes from Noble. Focus Entertainment will rename themselves to Pull Up Entertainment on April 1st, 2024. Uh, reviews for Like a Dragon and Tekken have popped today. Uh, like a Dragon Infinite Wealth has debuted on Open Critic at a 91, and then Ooh, Tekken 8 sorry. at a 91 as well. Wow. I think I, I might have lied about Like a Dragon actually. I think that's a 90. I think it's a solid 90. Yeah. Yeah, it's a solid 90 on Metacritic or on Open Critic. Uh, trash, top. trash from 91 to 90. Yeah, like <laughs> get this garbage out of here. Let's all play Tekken 8 this week. It's so fun, plus it's yeah. such a fun game. And oh, I played. I, uh, I'm not gotten a ch chance to talk about it. I'm sure I'll talk about it somewhere. I played about eight hours of Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth and was really, really digging it. But then I got codes that came in Tekken 8, and I was like, Yo, I gotta, I gotta play this. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I hope, I hope they get back to Like a Dragon because in those eight hours, I was like, Yo, this Ichiban fella, this dude's the homie. I love this guy. <laughs> He's great. Moving on, though, uh, Power World has sold over 6 million copies in only four days and hit an all-time peak player count, surpassing 1.7 million players. Insane. That's that's a, a bubble. Yeah. Could, do you, where, where does Power World go? I mean, I, 
I don't am, I, am I stopping it from being the Wii News channel if I interrupt? No, I mean, you can. <laughs> we only have one more thing here. Death Stranding Director's Cut arrives on iPhone, iPad, and Mac on January 30th, 2024. And that's the Wii News channel. I mean, I will say we are going long in the show, but I'm willing to talk about Power World. Because, like, I, when you talk about, like, the burst thing, right? There's so much around this game that is like ready to just ready to off. it's like if, if power world's a bubble it's a bubble that's like floating around a bunch of needles and it's like barely dodging so, so many like different a little ones. bit like 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 when among us blew up and i just remember thinking so stressed for the devs yeah right because i was like oh my god servers like like anything where there's an online server component i'm like this stresses me out yeah like, you know there's the, the power world guys having calls with epic you know someone's like doing the math of like server costs but six million people logging on playing this game all day and obviously they have the money now oh yeah but that money actually doesn't show up for two months <laughs> right, right? Oh, so yeah. you don't actually get paid out of steam and everything for like you got this two-month process mm -hmm. so they're sat on like, infinite oh, shit, wealth we, we, they're sat yeah. on this they got infinite wealth out there but right now someone's right now, going <laughs> this server is costing you like hundred thousand dollars a day like yeah boom and and they're like at the bank like trying to take out loans they're like we promise we have this money we just need to get these and i know out. that like somewhere <laughs> There are, there are meetings in Nintendo, right, where, like, the scenario in my head is, is parent leaves their kid playing video games, comes into the room, sees them playing Power World, yeah. right? Sees Pokemon with guns, and then they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe Nintendo's done this. Yeah. And they go ring up Fox News, whatever, right? And mm -hmm. so you know that, like... Nintendo's even, like, hey... Even like, if, like, us. legally there's no, no, not necessarily any harm done, yeah. like, you just know that there are all conversations happening there where they're like, ah, this feels like a thing we should be angry about. It, but. Like the, uh, the game currently like is striking me the same way that like PUBG did, where in 2017 PUBG was a similar story. All these concurrent players kind of came out of nowhere, doing this uh, like you know doing big numbers, and then toward the end of the year, Fortnite decided to do battle royale, and then like I mean PUBG is still maintained and like was a it has been a big thing, right? But Fortnite was the thing that really took off. I wonder for Power World if there is going to be another thing toward the end of the year. Maybe it is Fortnite. Maybe Fortnite's like, yo, what if you put Pokemon in it <laughs> and made a survival mode? They could do that. Like, they kind of just did it with amazing. Lego, yeah, but like, yeah. they, what if they added the Pokemon to the Lego thing? I don't know. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is like, a, if a lot of people are like, yo, this is taking off in a way when, when all of us could do this. Like so many of us have the ability to just do the same thing. I think a lot of people are going to jump on the trend and one person like one studio one game is gonna rise above above them all but i'm also just scared about like a lot of the um like i one of the things i've been saying I, in our slack channel is like i'm curious to see if this game even makes it to the end of the year where it is i, I think only up was the one last year that unreleased and we've seen flappy bird before these games that blow up bigger than the dev probably had any intention to and now they have all these eyes on them and now it's like Oh shit! And with Flappy Bird, it was like, okay, well, we have stolen assets, and then also the dev was stressed. But with this, it is. I saw I saw a quote from the dev uh, who said, "We thought we could just drop PVP in. Turns out it's more complicated." Yeah. And it, yeah, so that's that's like the th this is the thing that always scares me when you're, you're making plans, right? And and not to make it all about immortality, although that is what today's about. Yeah. Um, like there was a point when I originally wrote the ideas for immortality it's like we're gonna have this game mechanic where you can match cut anything in a scene and i'm like doing the math in my head of how much work is involved in this right like how complex how much just just effort is gonna take to take every frame capture every image on every frame mm -hmm. and i'm like i think this is doable but there was a period of about like three or four months where the initial prototype was like can we prove that sam's right yeah and there was always a chance that it would just be infeasible, right? It would be like, oh, actually, no, just the money or time it takes to do this thing, the amount of data it would create will just not work on a computer. And so sometimes in games, you have these questions where, you know, maybe satisfying the demands of this new audience for Power World mm -hmm. is, is that 10% of just adding PVP in and just fixing the things that people are complaining about is, is so much bigger than the team that it, yeah. you know, that's, that's the... the terrifying stuff and obviously yeah sometimes success can be horrific i mean yeah the, the mental the like, mental toll the, the, the mental toll that like Flappy Bird with the, took with like the amount of conversation around uh well, the, the other thing that so stressed me out was the the quote from the guy was we currently have fifty thousand bug reports sitting in our inbox yeah and i'm like okay if it takes a minute to read each bug report <sighs> like like it, yeah. it just it's hit a level where if you don't have that infrastructure terrifying yeah it's like what are you going to do with it 
Um, but yeah, we'll probably talk about more Power World probably throughout the year, so we don't need to have like a longer conversation. <laughs> even though I have a lot to say about Power World, I've not played enough. I haven't it. played it at all. I like literally logged in from ignorance. I like I, lo- I, I logged in, booted up. It took like ten steps, and I was like. This isn't my kind of game, <laughs> but I'm just going to watch other people talk about it and like watch the kind of funny stream play it and do all that stuff. But then also it's just, there's just too much to it. There's too much happening with Power World. Uh, now it's time for kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. That's where you write in and let us know what we got wrong as we got it wrong. So we can correct it for those watching later and listening later on podcast services around the globe. And guess what? Sam, me and you got nothing wrong. Nobody had nothing. anything to say about anything that we said. Wow. But we killed it. Great job. Nailed it. Uh, of course, this has been Kind of Funny Games Daily. Before we get out of here, Sam... Uh, I know we talked the whole show about immortality, but <laughs> is there anything you want, you'd like to plug? Is there a place where people can find you? Uh, yeah, they can see me on Twitter uh, as uh, Mr. Sambalo, MR Sambalo. Um, yeah, Immortality's out on PS5 today. You can also uh, go check out the Lost in Cult collection of script books, all this kind of cool merch uh, that has been launched today. You can go look on their website, lostincult.co.uk um yeah if you want you can also i forgot we <laughs> teased two new games uh yeah go, yeah go over to steam uh that and wish list you can wish list uh project c and project d and we'll do this thing we did it on immortality where if the wish list hit, hit a certain level we'll start revealing words we'll start peeling back mm-hmm. some of those Ooh. redacted things so you'll start to kind of get a sense for what these games are i love that um and if you work in the games industry we are going to be recruiting for both those projects as well so we've got some fun job roles coming up there you go. As a small life raft in this big chaotic yeah. mess. Um, I do want to bring in one more super chat from CJ Splitson, uh, who says, it's weird because Hi-Fi Rush and Hell- Hellblade 2 still took five years to make. I don't think just making shorter games means shorter develop- uh, development times. Take that, Sam. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> that's what I, I don't know. That's what some audience, that's what an audience member, even though CJ Splitson, I, I recognize the name, but... I, th- I mean, I don't think it translates to like some resources saved at the very least, right? I mean, the best, most humane way to make video games, and we're kind of, we, we've always tried to do this in our games, all that frustrates me, is take as much time as you can. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know, to some extent, Nintendo's a great example of this. Uh, apparently, the, the internal joke for Tears of the Kingdom was it's the game of Christmas of 2020X. Like, <laughs> they were like, oh, it's going to be out 2020 when they're gonna, like 2019, I think originally, I don't know. But mm-hmm. every year they were like, nah, it's not ready. It'll, yeah. it'll be next year's Christmas game, right? Uh, but they do, they do get that sometimes things take time, right? And ideas are better. Like if you're not rushing, things break less if you're not rushing. So yeah, ma- making a Hellblade in five years it's also is not the worst idea. Not the worst idea, like even if it's seven hours long. But then also like I still look at Hellblade and I'm like, that game looks incredible like that game has so much detail to it and so much going on that yeah i'm not surprised that even though it's uh seven eight hours long that it still took very long time to make because that game looks insane even the same with hi-fi rush where you know hi-fi rush also is a very incredible looking game and also incredible function i mean you know functioning uh, game. It, it does still solve the problem to some extent right if there yeah. are too many games too few hours i would happily pay 20 dollars for a five to ten hour game versus a 40 hour game I'll pay, I'll pay the same amount of money, right? Because that, that price tag doesn't actually mean anything, yeah. right? We've just kind of arrived at those. Like as, a, as an indie game dev, $20 is kind of where we, we have to sit, mm-hmm. right? If you, if, unless you're like Jonathan Blow going $50. Yeah. You kind of have to sit there. And it's $20, whether it's a 40-hour game or a 20-hour game or a 10-hour game, like it's kind of irrelevant. But yeah, as a player, being able to fit more fun things in. Of course, this has been Kind of Funny Games Daily. Each and every weekday, we run you through the nerdy news you need to know about live on YouTube, Twitch, and podcast services around the globe. If you love what we do, support us with the Kind of Funny membership on Patreon or YouTube to get all of the shows ad-free, watch us record them live, and get a daily exclusive show. Until next time, Game Daily.